Now we move on to the prophets. The Old Testament prophets call for fidelity to Israel's relationship or covenant with God. The prophets tell it as it is. They speak out not only on behalf of God, but also for those who have no voice. Fidelity must be shown through concern for the poor and the oppressed. The prophets, they are the people above all who confront Israel when the people forget the covenant. The prophets proclaim that concern for and fidelity to the covenant must be manifested in concern for the poor and oppressed. The prophets forth tell, they tell it forth. They're not just foretelling the future. They are expressing insights into the ways the people have broken the covenant up until then. And they speak not only on behalf of God, but for those who have no voice. Fidelity must be shown through concern for the poor and oppressed. We have a look at the prophet Amos, a man that lived around 900 years before Christ. He is one of the earliest of the prophets. And he is seen as one of the strongest in calling the people back to the way of justice. Israel at the time was at the height of her power when the Lord sent this poor shepherd, Amos, to speak out, and he certainly did not mince his words. Listen to this word, you cows of Bashan. Living in the mountain of Samaria, oppressing the needy, crushing the poor, saying to your husbands, bring us something to drink. The Lord Yahweh swears this by his holiness. The days are coming to you now when you will be dragged out with hooks, the very last of you with prongs. Israel was living at the height of its power and they were wealthy and gathering more and more wealth. And Amos has an indictment of luxury because of its connection to injustice. And he's quite specific about forms of injustices that were being practiced. Injustices, he says, are being practiced in the very courts of law. The judgments of the city elders, bribery rampant, merchants who fiddle with the scales, Amos chapter 8, the manipulation of market prices, selling people into slavery, and the list goes on. But what really gets to Amos is the ultimate horror. Those who have persecuted the poor and taken even the shirt off their back, they bring their extorted possessions into the very house of the Lord himself and present them. I hate and despise your feasts. I take no pleasure in your solemn feasts. Let me have no more of the din of your chanting, no more of your drumming and harps, but let justice flow like water and integrity like an unfailing stream. Let justice flow like water and integrity like an unfailing stream. Amos, strong voice, obviously. Isaiah, who lived in the 8th century before Christ, is calling the people back to justice. And he has a different, slightly different approach. He talks about holiness. To be holy, he says, means to be imbued with a passion for justice and for righteousness. Because he saw these qualities in God himself, in the way God dealt with Israel. And Isaiah was more embarrassed rather than angry at how the Israelites were responding and were living. His own reaction was one of humility, and he begins by himself. He started with himself. He looked at himself and he said, look, I'm not really ma matching up either myself. There's a lot of sinful living in my own life. I said, there is no hope for me. I am doomed because every word that passes my lips is sinful. And I live among a people whose every word is sinful, and yet with my own eyes, 
I have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the creatures flew down to me, carrying a burning coal that he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with the burning coal and said, This has touched your lips, and now your guilt is gone, and your sins are forgiven. So a humble man, Isaiah, saw his own weaknesses, confessed them, asked for forgiveness, and was forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And looking out, though, having started with himself, he saw that it would take some time before Israel would get around to being at full fellowship and having a right relationship with God and with the neighbour and with creation itself. Because he saw a lot of injustices round about him in both kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. They were replete with injustice. So we recognize three themes, really, in Isaiah, the same really set out by Amos and re-echoed by other prophets. The indifference of the rich to the poor, the indifference to Yahweh's law, unjust monopolization of the land, which brings Yahweh's wrath, and punishment leading to exile for the injustices that they had perpetrated. And Isaiah finishes the oracle by calling Yahweh the Holy One of Israel. And it is to this holiness which makes all of the unjust activity of the individual subject to punishment. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of your burnt offerings, of rams and fat of fattened animals, I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to appear before me, who asks this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me, new moons, sabbaths and convocations. I cannot bear your worthless assemblies, your new moon feasts, and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. And when you spread out your hands in prayer to me, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Do justice. Defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. So nowhere in the Old Testament is hypocrisy more clearly and forcefully condemned than Isaiah. True understanding of God and true worship of him can only be made by those who hunger and thirst for what is right, hunger and thirst for justice, and practice it in their lives. No room for pious worshippers. A pious worshipper who exploits or allows exploitation is not only a fraud, but an idolater. That's Isaiah's words, chapter 1, verses 11 to 17. And the final concern of Isaiah is his disappointment with leadership. The leadership of his time, the leadership being given, the kings have failed. And he goes on to talk about an ideal king the ideal ruler, the ideal political situation. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a covert from the tempest, like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Then the eyes of those who see will not be closed, and the ears of those who hear will hearken. The mind of the rash will have good judgment, and the tongue of the stammerers will speak readily and distinctly. The fool will no longer be called noble, nor the knave said to be honourable. The ideal situation. The kingdom will not only, this type of kingdom will not only be for Judah and for Israel, but this type of kingdom will be for the whole world, 
when the Messiah will come, his kingdom will be based on justice and integrity. And with the arrival of the ideal king, worship will be done properly, cult in the temple. The administration of justice will be excellent. It will be joined in Yahweh's perfect kingdom. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. A great dream, the powerful lines. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. So you have there an entire theology summed up by Isaiah. Yahweh has given his people his law, they have ignored it. They do not know the nature of true religion because they make false alliances with other groups, they seek other gods, they have empty cults, and the rich rob the poor through bribes and extortion. And for all of this, Judah will be punished until the ideal king comes of David's line. He can bring them all back to the practice of the law and to the true cult. In this renewed Israel, justice will be done. The nations of the earth will come to learn of Israel's justice. There will be no more laws and every tear will be wiped away. The Holy One of Israel will see his justice spread throughout the earth which he has made. And a quick look at one other prophet, the prophet Jeremiah, who lived in the 7th century before Christ. And in most instances, his message is similar to that of his predecessors, attacking apostasy, mouth worship, violent injustice in the land, reliance on foreign alliances and not on God. There will be repentance, the doctrine of punishment and the remnants return. Reform your ways and actions. Deal with each other justly. If you do not oppress the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods, then I will let you live in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder? Commit adultery and perjury. Follow other gods you have not known. But I have been watching, declares the Lord. And Jeremiah attacked institutions. He says a lot of people were putting their security, false security, in institutions of religion and were neglecting interhuman relationships and interhuman justice as the core of religious observance. And he was particularly strong against the ruler of his day, Joachim, because he was a bit of a rascal and was not following the ways of his father, Josiah. Josiah was considered a just king who did justice with righteousness, judged the cause of the poor and needy. Is not this to know me, says the Lord. So the conclusion is clear. True religion is doing justice. There is no distinction in the Old Testament between faith and doing justice. And justice is a very concrete thing. It's not an airy fairy ideal up there. It is the application of religious faith. And it's not just applying our faith, it is the substance of faith. And without it, God remains unknown. And Josiah, the one that Jeremiah praised, knew this 
and he is remembered as a just king for reforming cult and the promulgation of the Torah. He was the one who knew Yahweh, taking up the cause of the poor and the needy. And coming towards the end, we just say a word on covenant, another basic biblical category. You are my people and I am your God. It, this shows that God deals with us as a community. He dealt with his people as a community. So this communal corporate character colors the very nature of the covenant and what its obligations are. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all countries and bring you back to your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. And this community, it will be such a wonderful group. I will remove from your heart the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. So as Yahweh has dealt justly with his people, we are to deal justly with one another. And you will note the logic of the Old Testament. As I have dealt justly with you, so you are to deal justly with. The logical conclusion would be, in our Western way, to deal justly with me. But the Hebrew understanding, as I have dealt justly with you, says God, so you are to deal justly with one another. As God has loved us completely, so we are to love our brothers and sisters. This is the test of authenticity of the covenant, to deal justly with our brothers and sisters. The covenant recognizes that all people are equal in creation, equal in the fall as sinners, equal in forgiveness, equal in destiny. The celebration of the covenant means restoring justice in areas where inequality has crept in, and eliminating all forms of oppression. This covenant love, as we heard, is expressed in taking out of your flesh the heart of stone and giving you a heart of flesh. You shall be my people and I will be your God. By way of conclusion on our reflections concerning justice in the Old Testament, we note what the Second Vatican Council teaches. Council tells us that the books of Scripture must be acknowledged as teaching firmly, faithfully, and without error that truth which God wanted to put into the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. The Old Testament is part of this history, this history of our salvation, and it is a portion of our inheritance. And Jesus, when at last he came, he stated that the Old Testament is impossible to annul. And he uses a typical Jewish phrase, it is written, when he's introducing a statement that it is authoritative and not open to question. For example, when he was facing the tempter, it is written. Certain events will take place, like going to Gethsemane. He uses the words of scripture, graphe, it is written. These meant that any of these references was Jesus recognizing the power and authority of the Old Testament. Indeed, in the New Testament, there are 51 references to graphe, it is written, authoritative parts of the Old Testament. And the New Testament referred to the writings of the Old Testament as the oracles of God. So, to live our faith means to live justly. This is what God asks of you, to act justly, to love tenderly, and to walk humbly with your God. <laughs>